Matthew writes a gospel that challenges the insiders. Matthew wants those who are part of the covenant family to see that they need the Messiah. You would think that this would be a cause for celebration, but we find in Matthew's recounting of Christ's arrival in history that this is not a time that compels the insiders to celebrate Christ's arrival. What are we to learn from this gospel as fellow insiders? What is the significance of the insiders rejecting Christ? Well, when we talk about the Christian life and we talk about living an ethical life, it's interesting when we consider the nature of ethics because God doesn't just want a moral people that live according to the standard of his law. What God desires is he desires uh, people who are immoral people who conform to his law and the power of his spirit. Now, these two statements may not sound radically different. But when you consider what Christ is doing here, and again, you think about the life of Moses, starting at Sinai, ending on Nebo, uh, giving his farewell in Deuteronomy, you're very much seeing uh, this parallel and this working out with Christ and what Christ is doing here. And so in, in terms of this, uh, we may think, well, what's the difference between just being a moral people and living by the standard of the law versus being a moral people that desire uh, to walk in the power of the Spirit and conform to the same standard of the law? Well, as we consider that and we pick up where we left off in Matthew 18, uh, we'll see first the defending of the weak, offending one's weakness, and lastly, defending the weakest. And so defending the weak, uh, we remember, or hopefully we remember, uh, in the context that we have the little one. And so as Christ has talked about the little one, he's taken the little one, he's taken an anonymous child and brought that anonymous child into the mix of his disciples. They were asking who's the greatest. Uh, They wanted to know who was prestigious, who was significant, and who was important. And so Christ brings this anonymous child into the mix and says, whoever becomes like one of these will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, which means emptying oneself of all significance and finding significance exclusively in Christ. And so when we consider this reminder, Christ now goes on to talk about the little one and what it means with this little one and the reception of this little one. That the reception of this little one is a taking hold of this little one and understanding that the weakest in the kingdom is a significant one. And now as he again appeals to this child and talks about this child and the reception of this child, he gives a serious warning. Then he says uh, that the one, as Jesus walks on this earth, he's come to save his people from their sins. And the one who causes this child to stumble is one who is in a dire predicament and one ought to be concerned. And so this does tell us something at the outset. Uh, First and foremost, um, we are not going to reach perfection in this life. It's going to be a continual struggle. And so this is an important thing to remember. As Christ is going to the cross to save his people from their sins, what's the temptation? Well, if Christ dies on the cross, he's raised to life. It means I can be perfect. Well, Christ is telling us that's not the case. The other thing is that there can be the little ones who can stumble. And the other thing is, we can cause those little ones to stumble. We may say, well, why is that such a big deal? Why is that such a big problem? Well, Christ warns us that if we're uh, living careless and not worrying about the nature of this, he's saying that if one is consciously trying to make these little ones stumble, it's better to have a millstone tied around their neck. That's pretty dire. This is pretty severe. It certainly echoes back as I intend to read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. And just again, reviewing that concept. Because again, you think about Christ doing his farewell, like Moses, reliving Israel's history. He's recounting the moral standard of the law of God. And so he's making echoes back to that very uh, Sermon on the Mount. And so in terms of, of this millstone, 
you can think of these handheld millstones that uh, mostly women would use, and they would grind up and ground up uh, all sorts of things to make it smaller, to make bread and all sorts of, of different types of food. But there's other millstones that were far larger. Uh, these were millstones that were basically turned by animals. We've probably seen these in old movies where you have a mule or a donkey or a horse attached to the millstone would walk in a circle, and as it walks in a circle, it grounds up whatever uh, the particular mill might want to grind up. And so this millstone is rather large. So if you have that image in your head, which Christ intends, he's saying it's actually better to tie a rope to that millstone, tie it around your neck, and have it thrown into the sea. And now he may say, well, why would we want to do this? Is Christ advocating suicide? Is Christ saying that's really the intention here? No, what Christ is saying is that in terms of our own individual Christian lives, we need to have a consciousness of living life before the Lord. And as we live our life before the Lord, that if we're going to go about and try and make little ones stumble, and, and we're consciously doing this, he's saying it's actually better to die early than to go on and to face the final judgment of God. So again, this being thrown into the sea shouldn't be arbitrary language. Now, this isn't necessarily saying that you get cast into hell or you desire to be cast into hell. This is rather that you would rather be cast into the realm of the dead. And so it seems that, that Christ is drawing a subtle distinction here. He's saying you're better off actually dying early before you continue to pursue this sin than to actually fully give in to it and to uh, once again fall into the hands of a sovereign and mighty God. And so, when you hear this, you say, wow, this is pretty severe. Because the reality is, you say, well, what's, what's the big deal about the little one? Well, what is the standard of the kingdom? What, what, what is Christ coming to do? What are the disciples fighting about? What is the temptation at Eden? The temptation at Eden is to have significance. To be in the place of God. To stand above the Lord and to say, I'm determining what's right and wrong. And so now when you hear this stumbling, you say, okay, so these are individuals who are standing up saying, I determine what's right or wrong. Now we may say, well, these are only fleshly sins. Well, that's certainly true. You can find that in Corinth. Uh, you can find that there's people going into the church of Corinth who are basically advocating whatever I do in the flesh, whatever desires I desire to pursue, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's only the body. And the Apostle Paul says, that's a false economy. The Lord created our bodies. He created our souls and we're called to honor them in our bodies. So yes, this is certainly warning us against sinning in a certain way where we may just be boisterous and say, hey, it doesn't matter what I do in the flesh. It's only the flesh. That's one element of it that, yes, we, we ought to be putting that to death and evaluating our lives in light of the Lord. But where is Christ going? And we need to remember this in a farewell because I think it's very significant. Christ is going to Jerusalem to die. He's told his disciples this. Peter himself was told what? Get behind me, Satan. And so Peter himself was causing Christ to stumble. Why? Because Peter said, this isn't the way of the kingdom, Lord. There's got to be another way. Don't go to the cross. And Christ is saying, but I have to go to the cross. Get behind me, Satan. Who else is going to try Christ and try and make him stumble? Certainly Satan, but the Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests are all joining together. Why? Because they say this is our expectation of a Messiah. This is what a Messiah is to look like. And, and you don't look like that Messiah. Therefore, there's a problem with you and you need to die. And so you're finding that these men who are leading Israel away, they're teaching them, oh, you don't need to follow this Christ. You don't need to follow this rabbi. He's a false teacher. He's, he's not real. Just turn away, you know, and, and do what you want. And so you're seeing another example of where the flesh gets in the way of our Christian life, where the Apostle Paul also warns us. When we try and just simply live out the Christian life in our own strength, we will fail. And that's what Christ is warning us. He's saying it's not just step out and do. It's not just try harder. It's a humility of coming before the Lord and saying, I need to be a little one. 
I need to be anonymous. I need to find my identity and life exclusively in Christ. So if you talk about a cross ethic in terms of the little one, this is essential. That we are those who are the little ones and need to empty ourselves of significance in terms of the world and go against our fallen human nature by the power of the Spirit to conform to our Lord. And to understand that as we consciously say, how do I live more consistently as a little one? How do I live more consistently to my Lord? How do I bring glory to my God? You see, again, these are the questions Matthew desires us to ask, what Christ wants us to ask. John does a long apologetic about who Christ is as Messiah. Matthew is saying, this is the Son of God. Whether you believe it or not, for Matthew, it doesn't matter. Don't really care. The reality is he is the son of God. And the way of life is emptying yourself of significance and being found in him. But now there's another point that Christ drives home. Because what is the temptation we have, and especially in America where everyone's a victim? The reality is that we're going to say, well, I'm not really held accountable because it's not really my sin. Somebody else has made me do it. And so a the, the, the weak one or the little one can say, I'm just a little one, I'm vulnerable, and it's not my fault, it's the other person's. Now Christ goes on and says, listen, the reality is we're all tempted to give in to sin. This is our struggle. And the temptation is rather than taking ownership of our own sin as human beings, What did Adam and Eve do? Hey, Lord, if you didn't give me this woman, I would have been successful. She says, hey, if you didn't create the snake, we wouldn't be in this mess. It's really your fault, Lord. I didn't do it. That's humanity. And so our temptation is to say, well, I'm just a little one. I'm not really guilty. I didn't do anything wrong. And Christ is being very, very down to earth here and saying, understand, the Lord's standard's clear. Living unto the Lord is very clear. Seeking to conform to the Lord is very clear. Now, it's not Christ beating us up. He's not shaming us. He's not trying to bring us to a place where we just feel as if there's no hope. But it's rather Christ saying to us, when these temptations come, don't just make excuses. Understand we have a Redeemer and we're called to reach out to this Redeemer and to call upon this Redeemer. That's where our life is. When we empty ourselves of significance, as he's exhorted us at the opening of this chapter, now he's exhorting us to walk in this insignificance in Christ. And he's saying, listen, temptations are going to come. So this tells us something else about the community. Satan's going to continue to tempt us. We're going to continue to tempt ourselves. There's going to be things around us that we're going to value more than the Lord. Whether we see ourselves as strong or whether we see ourselves as a little one, whether we find relief uh, from a particular struggle in sin that's been going on for however long, the Lord's saying, understand, temptations are real and they're out there. And as I've already mentioned, our temptation is to say, it's not really my fault. Uh, Somebody else made me do it. The devil made me do it. Or something else was going on. Not really my fault. Christ is saying, understand the severity of sin. Again, you go back or I go back to the Garden of Eden. When we think about the Garden of Eden, what was the beauty of that garden? Well, I mean, obviously the Lord's creation and not having any weeds, not having any a thing wrong with it. But the ultimate beauty was man was in perfect fellowship with God. That's what Christ has come to restore. When man sinned, he had no shame walking around the garden naked. After the sin, what happens? They cover themselves. They're ashamed. They don't want to come into the presence of God. And so the Lord is telling us, I'm telling you how to once again overcome the shame of sin. And he's saying the first thing you have to do is understand the severity of it. So now as Christ goes on, he talks about cutting off the hand, cutting off the foot, gouging out the eye. Uh, better to enter, be, go through life as a cripple than to uh, basically have your body intact. Now again, this is an echo back to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verse 29 through 30, where he says, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. 
For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now hopefully you hear this and you find it puzzling. Because really when God has created us, he created us to be in the image of God. This means even human human beings who are fallen, who aren't even in Christ, have a an, an innate or a certain or born in dignity because God has created them. And so you, you read this and you say, wait a minute, our Lord has said this in two places in his ministry, the beginning of his ministry, the end of his ministry. Is our Lord telling the church that we have to actually uh, cut off limbs? Is that really the, the goal? Is this a, a form, maybe the Roman Catholics or the more radical Roman Catholics, I should be charitable to them, but the more radical Roman Catholics where you, you actually harm the body or do miserable things, you know, and again, it depends on where they go with the level of penance, some being more extreme than others. Are they right? Is that what Christ is saying? That if you're an amputee, you are more pious and you, you love the Lord more than someone else. Is that the intention of this? Well, what is Matthew doing? Do you think Matthew is really telling us to mar the image of God? Do you think Matthew is really giving the church permission to harm people and to mutilate the flesh? Because somehow if we mutilate the flesh, we'll make the spirit conform, as some of the arguments for penance in the Roman Catholic Church put forth. Or is there something else going on here? Christ is speaking in hyperbole. Christ is not advocating that we literally gouge out our eye if it causes us to sin. Christ is not advocating we literally cut off hands and feet and legs and harm ourselves. But what Christ is telling us is he's saying, here's the severity of sin. He's moving from a lesser to the greater. It's better to lose a part of the body or a piece of the body than to fall into the hands of a just God. It's better to give up that sin or do whatever you need to give up that sin rather than fall into the hands of a just God who's going to prosecute um, his justice fully. And so you hear this and say, that's, that's pretty severe. Because Christ is telling us that even as a little one, if you say, well, somebody else made me do it, Christ is saying, that's, that's not going to cut it. The reality is we have to evaluate our lives before our Lord and see where we need to conform. This is a a thing where I need to do this, you need to do this. This is an individual thing. How do I need to conform to my Lord more consistently? Something else about this in terms of this message that Christ gives us, which is pretty tough. He tells us that there's this threat of the hell fire, the Gehenna fire. And again, the Valley of Gehenna is a Garbage that burns and it never goes out and it continues to burn. It's, it's a terrible picture. It's a terrible image. Uh, we don't really have anything in our society that fully communicates that. But in this day and age, they would be thinking of, of this valley where garbage continues to get thrown in. The incinerator continues to go. It's never shut down for maintenance. It just burns and burns and burns and burns. And so this isn't just a, a one-time judgment where one is done. But this is that... Reminder that it doesn't matter if one's a Jew. It doesn't matter if one's a Gentile. It doesn't matter if one's been part of the covenant community their whole life. It doesn't matter if they're genealogically tied to Abraham. This is again, Matthew, remember the insider-outsider distinction. An insider is one who embraces Jesus Christ as the Messiah. An insider is one who says, I need this Lord to be my redeemer and to save me from my sins. And I desire to walk in him as one of his children. I want to conform to him. I want to bring glory to him, even as I struggle through this world. That's what Christ is reminding us. And so he's saying to the disciples, listen, gentlemen, just because you walked with me and you're part of me doesn't mean you're in. You think of Judas. This is a very staunch warning specifically to Judas. doesn't matter if the Lord's using him as a means of carrying out redemption. Judas still desired to betray his Lord. Judas still desired to hand him over uh, to the leaders of Israel who were conspiring to kill Christ. He's still held accountable for this. 
And Christ is giving him the warning. And so the reality is Christ is saying, listen, as I go to the cross and I take away your sin, you've got to find life in me. This, this isn't just a stepping stone. This isn't just some sort of motivational thing. This is a reality. You have to find life in me and in me exclusively. And we may say, well, then what's the hope of this kingdom? If we're going to struggle, as we heard, first point, we're going to struggle uh, with probably wanting to be significant. We're going to struggle with maybe potentially making someone else stumble. We can try and make an excuse, but the Lord's not going to hear those excuses as we've heard. Well, then what's the hope? I mean, why, why continue to meet together? Why serve this God if he's just going to cast us into hellfire? Is that really what he's about? The Lord goes on and he does this wonderful parable in the midst of this, recalling for us the nature of his ministry. So if we identify ourselves as the little ones, we empty ourselves of hope and self, we say, well, what's the hope? Christ is saying, let me tell you what the hope is in this. So he warns us, don't despise the little ones. Don't, don't despise the weak ones. Don't despise the struggling ones. We're all struggling. We're all little ones. We've got to see ourselves as that. But he noticed that these little ones, that as a community we could cast away, we could trample, we can forget about or forsake. But what does he tell us? The angels in heaven tend to these little ones. They're angels, he says. Now again, there's some that I think take this too literally. And they say that this means that all of us have an individual guardian angel. Not necessarily sure that that's right or wrong. We, we don't really know from scripture if that's 100% sure. But we do know about angels. And in our tradition, we probably downplay it more, where I think other traditions probably play it up more than they should. But whatever the case, what, what do we know about angels? Well, when he talks about these angels that come into the presence of God and see the Lord's face, these are not the angels like in Isaiah 6, verse 2, where you have the seraphim and they have the wings that cover their face. Because they're the ones that, you know, they can't look upon the face of God. It seems that there may be these other angels that actually come into the presence of God. And these are the angels that care for the little insignificant ones that we might say or society might say don't really matter. But what else do we know of angels? We know from Hebrews 1 verse 14, they're ministering spirits sent from God to care for his people, to care for his elect. We know from Psalm 91 11, that Satan uses that text to tempt Christ. Why? Because there's a promise that if Christ falls or if one of God's people fall, that the Lord sends his angels to pick them up, which implies that his angels actually fight on our behalf. We read of the angels going to war. We read of the angels fighting on behalf of God's people. Uh, we read of the angels as being messengers, Gabriel coming directly from God, bringing messages. And so the reality is this, this theology of angels is something I don't think we're going to fully grasp till we get to glory. And I don't think we have to fully grasp until we get to glory. But what Christ is assuring us is that angels are real. And he's assuring us that these angels are those who are sent from God to care for his people. So we may not have necessarily one particular guardian angel, but the promise is we, we have many angels that the Lord sends at different times to do what needs to be done according to the Lord's will. How this works out, Scripture's not clear. When the Lord does this, Scripture's not clear. But what we know from this text is that the Lord does send his angels to care for us and even these little ones. And again, we can get so lost in, in, in the minute details where we say, oh, so what does this mean about me? It means that the Lord really loves his people. That's what it means. And it means the Lord really loves you as he has called you. That's what it means. And it means that the Lord really has sent his angels to defend and to protect you. But it tells us something more that goes beyond that point. That the ones that the world and even the Christian community may cast off and say, well, they're insignificant. You think of the Pharisees, for example. Prestigious men. Determining right and wrong. Can actually even condemn the Son of God and saying he's not holy enough for them. They're the important ones. They can discard people at will. 
Or God says those who empty themselves of significance find their contentment in Christ, find their redemption in Christ, that the Lord actually assigns heavenly angels, heavenly warriors is the implication here to defend and to protect them and to guide them by the Lord's command, doing the Lord's will. And so the Lord is saying, if these little ones are that important to your heavenly father, how important ought they to be to you? How important is it for us to understand our life being held in the hand of God is the most precious thing that can ever be? That's what Christ is driving home here. So he's saying, let's not just hear this warning against sin. Let's not just hear this warning against hell. Those are real things. But he's saying, let's understand what you've been called to. You've been called to serve the Lord. And we may say, well, how sovereign is this God? Well, now he goes on and he says, listen, as the Lord sends his, his angels, he say, oh, so he sends his helpers. He tells us, no, listen. It's even more than the Lord just sending his helpers. The one who's a shepherd, who has that one lost sheep, he's got a hundred sheep. You could say, well, what's a one, what's a one little sheep? I mean, just let it go. Who cares? We got 99. Why endanger ourselves and get that one? Well, what does he do? He leaves the 99, probably leaves them with another shepherd. Who knows? I mean, there's a risk that shepherd might say, what 99 sheep? You know, that's a reality. That, that we can miss in the text. I'm not saying that just to be funny. It's a reality. Farmer, another guy may say, well, he only left me 90 or, or whatever. So there's a risk that's involved there. And there's a risk that's greater in going out by himself to get that one sheep who has wandered. How do you know a wolf hasn't gotten to it? How do you know that a coyote hasn't gotten to it? How do you know that some other wild animal hasn't snatched it up and might be lying in, in, in wait for you? But nevertheless, our Father in heaven goes and seeks out this one little weak one. Because why? He doesn't desire any to perish. Perish here, I would argue, is a twofold meaning in what he's already laid out. Dying early, premature death, being cast into the, just the, the regular lake with the millstone, and also perishing in terms of the valley of Gehenna of that never-ending fire. And so it's the Father and Christ assuring us of the purpose of his mission. His primary mission is not to condemn. It's not to put down. It's not to harm. But it's for Christ to lay down his life as a shepherd and to take it up again so we can have life in him and in him alone. This is what it means for Christ to save us from our sins. So again, John, John 10, you think of that whole shepherd narrative. But here in Matthew, this is a rather profound thing. Severe warning. Hey, don't be like the outsider. Don't dabble with sin, but here's your hope. Your heavenly father, don't test the boundaries of his love. But here's how much he will go to find his sheep. And so when we think about where we started with our sermon we think about this distinction of living a moral life, of just trying to conform to the law and conform to the royal standard of God versus living a moral life as one finds their life in the spirit as joining to Christ. We may say, well, the outcome may look the same. So what's the radical difference? Well, as we look at this, there is a difference because we need to understand that life and the power of life only comes as we are set apart in Christ. That that power that is ours is coming from heaven itself, from our heavenly father. The Pharisees are those who are laying out a life where they're saying, well, this Christ guy might be kind of interesting, but he's not really the Messiah. You don't need him. We know how to do this. And so you find they become the moralists. They become the ones that say, just try harder, just do, and eventually you'll conform, and eventually you'll be holy enough to receive the blessings of God. The tragic truth of the gospel is we will never be holy enough to receive the blessings of God by our own efforts. That's what Christ is teaching us. We are only going to be recipients of the holiness of God as we bow our heads and we take upon ourselves the yoke of Christ and we seek to give and make ourselves smaller and smaller before his face. Understanding that as we are his creatures, 
who have been redeemed in Christ, were called to live for him. As I pick up Bovink again, I read a recently translated work of Reformed Ethics. Bovink says this, Ethics is the art of fruitful, godly living and dying well, to God's glory. Our moral life must not be identified with our religious life of fellowship with God, but it must also never be separated from it. That was a quote I had to read several times over because it is just so profound. And what Bobbing simply saying is this, that we do not have the power within ourselves to conform to God. We don't. We are not going to come to God in our own strength. We are not going to please God by setting out our own moral standard. We are not going to do it. However, when we live our lives in the power of Christ, This is where Bob Inc. is saying, as we're meditating on the law of God, which is good, and as we're thinking about the revelation of God, which is good, that our hearts begin to conform. And we start to think, wait a minute, these are good things, and I need to to measure up to them, but I'm only going to do this in the power of the Spirit. And so that's what Bob Inc. is saying. If we try and do this in our own strength, we become Pelagians, which means we think we can overcome sin. The effects of sin are not that bad. But he's saying sin has radically permeated the essence of our being. But as we are conscious and humble of the redemption we have in Christ, then we begin to conform. As the Spirit is at work in us, prodding us, as we start reading about his revealed will and how we ought to conduct ourselves and saying, wait a minute, this is what I'm called to do. I'm not doing this. Where do you turn? Do you turn to self or do you turn to the Lord? And say, in the power of your spirit, I need to conform unto you. What Christ is telling us is that the Christian life and the cross ethic is a conscious understanding that we're going to continually need to grow in this life. We are not going to arrive at perfection. But as you hear the words of Christ, before we get overwhelmed with that concept, before we're tempted to just give up in the Christian life and say, well, why would I continue then? Christ is saying you're going to continue because your heavenly father is a good shepherd who has sent me to redeem you and seek you out. It's because your father has given you his spirit and has given you new life and has joined you to the Trinitarian God. And even the angels in heaven, the mighty warriors of God who are busy praising God and doing whatever God assigns them to do. Keep in mind, God determines the days watches over all the animals, tends to all the world affairs. I mean, you think about that. Just watch the little animals in your day-to-day life and start thinking, wow, God is watching over all these things. And yet he still has time to send his angels to the little ones and to see to it that his people are nourished, cared for, and continue to sojourn through this life. When our Lord is giving us these exhortations, He's not doing this to beat us up or to harm us, but he's doing this to encourage us and saying living a life in the power of the spirit, desiring to conform to God. That's a meaningful life. That's a meaningful life. Living life for self, that's not a life that's going to end well. But Christ is saying a life lived in the power of the spirit, conscious of your redemption in Christ, of the Father's call and care, and knowing that you are called to dwell with him forever in heaven, that's a meaningful life. Let us then, as we struggle, desire to be one of the little ones, and desire to bring our lives in conformity to the Lord, not in our own strength, but as we walk in the power of his Spirit, as his redeemed people, who have moved from death to life, and our Savior. Amen. Thank you for listening to our sermon. We hope and pray that our sermons encourage you as you sojourn on your Christian walk. If you have any questions about our church, please contact our pastor through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. That is urcbelgrade.com. We also have many sermon series archived and available for download on our website 
urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we would love to have you join us in our Christian sojourn by being part of our congregation. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.